Um, let me give you my perspective on Regal. Uh, it will, to some extent, duplicate what Allison said. I think there are two differences between the Regal case and Wyeth versus Levine, which we'll hear about in a few minutes. The first is that, unlike Wyeth, Regal involved express preemption. Congress put an express preemption provision in the statute. So it, the case turned entirely on statutory construction. It did not, unlike uh, Levine, Wyeth versus Levine, involve a judicial assessment of whether state and federal law were somehow in conflict or whether state law would frustrate the purposes of Congress or any of those amorphous policy-laden inquiries. It was purely a question of construing a statutory provision that Congress had enacted about 30 years earlier. And second, um, unlike uh, Wyeth versus Levine, where I think there were close and difficult arguments perhaps on both sides, I, I don't personally view Regal as being a close or difficult case. The district court had found preemption in Regal. The Court of Appeals had affirmed, and the Supreme Court affirmed the Court of Appeals by an eight to one vote, even uh, as Allison said, Justice Stevens was forced to conclude that the claims were preempted because the statute was, I think, that clear. Now, as Allison said, the uh, medical device amendments, there's a provision in the medical device amendments, section 360 KA of Title 21, which provides, and I think we ought to focus, it's hard to describe this case without focus on the exact language that the Supreme Court was construing, and it's in your, it's in your materials. That section preempts all state, quote, requirements, all requirements <coughs> with respect to a medical device that are, quote, different from or in addition to any requirements imposed on that device by federal law. It was obvious here what Congress had in mind. When the FDA scrutinizes a medical device and imposes requirements on that device as to how the device, for example, is to be designed or what warnings are to be given, that's, that, that's supposed to be the exclusive design and exclusive warnings that control that device and any requirements that a state imposes that are different from or addition to those requirements are preempted. Now, the device in question in Regal, and I think we ought to talk about the device, uh, was the was Medtronic's Evergreen Balloon Catheter which is a class three medical device that underwent the FDA's thorough pre-market approval process. Now there are a number of classes of medical devices. Class three devices involve the most sophisticated medical devices dealing with life-threatening conditions and they re received the most thorough scrutiny from the FDA. Uh, the Supreme Court said in Medtronic versus Law based on FDA provided materials that the average PMA receives about 1,200 hours of scrutiny from the FDA. Now this balloon catheter is used by physicians to open clogged artery, arteries of patients suffering from coronary disease. Uh, during an angioplasty procedure, the catheter is inserted into the artery, it's inflated with a saline solution, and then it's deflated once the procedure is complete. Uh, the FDA, in this case, reviewed the device specifications and clinical and non-clinical studies that Medtronic submitted as part of its PMA application and it found that the Evergreen Balloon Catheter was safe and effective for its intended use when designed, manufactured, and labeled in accordance with the exact specifications set forth in the PMA application. Specifically, the labeling approved by the FDA said that the catheter should not be used in patients who have calcification in their arteries, and the labeling also said that the device should not be inflated beyond eight atmospheres. Now, the plaintiff in this case, Charles Regal, suffered from calcified stenosis in his arteries, so the catheter should never have been used in his case. In addition, the physician who used the catheter inflated it to a, to a, a pressure of 10 atmospheres in direct contravention of the label on the device, which, as I said, said that it should never be inflated beyond eight atmospheres. Uh, predictably, the uh, device burst and Mr. Regal was seriously injured. So we have here a case in which a medical device was put to a contraindicated use because it was used on calcified arteries and was then misused because it was overinflated. This was an obvious case of medical malpractice. But the Regals decided to bring a uh, product liability case against Medtronic, the manufacturer of the device, claiming that the 
catheter was defectively designed and improperly labeled, even though the design and labeling, as I said, had been expressly approved by the FDA as part of the PMA process. Now, the question for the Supreme Court was a very straightforward one, was whether these, if these state law claims, design defect and failure to warn, were preempted by the express preemption provision of the medical device amendments to the FDCA, uh, which, as I said a moment ago, and I think it's important to repeat the statutory language, provides that state requirements are preempted if they're different from or in addition to any requirement imposed on the device by federal law. Uh, and as I said, Congress's obvious purpose was to have a single regulator, the FDA, decide how sophisticated and life-saving medical devices should be designed and what warnings should be given, rather than leave those decisions to 50 different states, which might reach quite different and inconsistent decisions. Uh, I don't think there were great policy decisions here, as I said. I think it's purely a question of looking at the statutory language and giving, and giving it its most reasonable interpretation. Now, the first question the Supreme Court had to answer was whether federal law imposed any requirements as to how the catheter had to be designed and labeled. As Allison said, 12 years earlier in Medtronic versus Lohr, the court had held that the FDA had not imposed any design or labeling requirements on medical devices approved through the so-called 510K process since that process, which was much less rigorous than the PMA process, didn't really involve any safety review. It simply involved a determination of whether the device at issue was similar to a device that was already on the market when the uh, medical device amendments were passed in 1976. All the FDA did through the 510K process was decide substantial similarity, not safety and effectiveness. And as a result, the Supreme Court held in law that the federal process did not impose any requirements on the device within the meaning of the preemption provision. But by contrast, the court held in Regal that the FDA's pre-market approval process did impose federal requirements as to the design and labeling of the balloon catheter because the FDA had to uh, satisfy itself that the device was safe and effective in the, uh, in the way it was designed and labeled, uh, or else it couldn't have been given approval and also because Medtronic was not free to deviate from the design or labeling approved by the FDA without getting express FDA approval. Medtronic was, in other words, required by federal law to design and label the device exactly as approved by the FDA. Now, on the state side of the equation, the court went on to hold that the duties that Regal claimed were imposed on Medtronic by New York common law constituted, quote, requirements within the meaning of Section 360 KA. And once again, I don't think this was a, 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 an original or new or surprising holding because the court had uh, relied on a long line of its cases holding that state common law duties impose, quote, requirements just as much as state statutes or regulations do. In fact, the previous year it had held that in a case called Bates. And there are cases at least stretching back to the 1950s in which the court had held that. 1959, the Garmin case, which preceded the uh, enactment of the medical uh, device amendments. The court also held that a state requirement is a requirement with respect to a medical device, even if it applies, as all common law duties do, to products in addition to medical devices. Now, I don't find this as uh, perverse as, as Allison does. I think as Justice Breyer said in his um, concurring opinion in, uh, in the Lohr case, if Congress had wanted to give the states a role to play here, it would have been perverse for Congress to have excluded state regulatory agencies, state mini FDAs who had the real expertise in regulating medical devices, excluding them from imposing any requirements on a medical device and yet let juries in individual cases who only see one patient, one plaintiff, make those rules. So I don't find that perverse at all. Uh, so the court held that the federal government had imposed design and labeling requirements with respect to the device, and that New York common law also sought to impose design and labeling requirements with respect to the same device. The only remaining question for the Supreme Court was whether the requirements that New York law supposedly imposed on the designs design and labeling, uh, on the device's design and labeling were different from, or as I said, in addition to the requirements imposed by federal law. And the court here held that they were, 
because the plaintiffs have never, never claimed that Medtronic had violated federal law in the way it designed the device or in the way it warned about the device, and yet the plaintiffs were claiming something additional was required to make that device safe under New York law. Uh, but as Allison said, the court went on to hold that uh, a state claim would not be preempted if the state requirements were identical to the federal requirements, because in that event, state law would simply be providing a different or additional remedy rather than imposing a different or additional requirement. And a lot of the post-regal litigation uh, on involving medical devices has really turned on whether in one way or another state law is imposing an identical or parallel requirement. Now, the only dissenter in Regal was Justice Ginsburg. And, and I think there, too, it's uh, instructive that Justice Ginsburg really didn't take issue, I think, with the court's analysis of the words of the statute. But she believed that when Congress, uh, that Congress, when it passed Section 360 KA, really couldn't have intended to preempt state common lawsuits seeking compensation for injuries caused by uh, medical devices. I don't know whether that's true or not, but I think the court, court was uh, required, as you as judges are often required, simply to construe the language that Congress used and not to try to make uh, judgments about what Congress may have intended. I think the overriding message from the Supreme Court's decision in Regal was that we're dealing here with class three medical devices. They are very sophisticated medical devices very complicated medical devices, very difficult trade-offs have to be made between safety and effectiveness. You can always make a device more safe, but you may well be making it much less effective. So someone has to make the judgment of how, what the trade-off is between safety and effectiveness, and Congress concluded that that decision should be made by the expert federal regulator, the FDA, rather than by juries who, as Justice Scalia said in his opinion for the court, only see that one plaintiff and really don't see the universe of cases in order to make a sound judgment as to where that line should be drawn. Now, the other thing that makes the Regal decision important but narrow is, as I said, it only applies to these class three medical devices that reach the market through the PMA approval process, and really very few, very few uh, class three devices do. I think that court re uh, referred to statistics from 2005, which was the, I think, the most recent year in which there were statistics available, which showed that of the medical devices that reached the market, 3,100 had reached it through the 510K process, which was the substantial similarity process that the court dealt with in law, only 30 through the PMA process. So we're dealing with a very small number of very sophisticated medical devices that have gone through a very arduous review process by the FDA. And once they've done that, once the, once the FDA has determined how they should be designed, how they should be labeled, uh, the court held in Regal that it was not up to the states, either through regulators or through their juries, to decide that uh, there should be a different design or a different uh, warning given. That, that was the ruling in Regal. Thank you. Thank you.